interpretation. So that was the group. So I've really got four key objectives today. Uh, I want to illustrate the magnitude of the risk that is associated with lithium ion battery fires. I want to enable some of you that may not have seen a battery fire to see a live fire. Uh, I want you to understand why these fires take place, why they're different to other types of fire. And I want to give you an understanding of the AVD and AVD fires complete product range. So first of all, I thought we'd just go through some battery technology, just so that everyone has a, a bit of an idea, just in case I'm using terminology that you're not familiar with. So I laid out on the desk here some of the devices from my home. And I think everyone has seen a massive change in terms of the use of lithium ion batteries in many, many different devices over the last five to 10 years. So as I look around here, so we have, so this is the drill battery and on the base of the battery, it's giving us 3000 milliamp hours or three amp hours. And it's also telling me it's 48 watt hours. So the amp hours or the charge capacity and the total energy is the watt hours. So that's the amps times the volts times the time. So I'll be referring throughout these presentations to watt hours, which gives you an idea of the size of the battery. So when you've been looking, for example, at uh, the adverts for cars and it says, uh, you know, it's capable of uh, covering 320 miles on one charge. So if we look at this illustration here, this is a Tesla car with the batteries in the base. So that is a, a complete electric vehicle and it's probably somewhere in the region of 90 kilowatt hours. Uh, you, everyone's got their phones with them. This is a battery out of the old iPhone. So my iPhone's a slightly bigger one, if I just show you that, this one. And the previous version of that has this battery. And this battery is called a pouch cell and it's 6.5 watt hours. So in order to kind of gauge how much energy you've got, you're looking at the watt hours. Now that is pouch cell, as I say. So it's very lightweight. And the reason that we've all got all of these battery devices now is because the energy density was improved by the advent of lithium ion technology. So you've actually got more energy per kilogram of weight. So these drills, you know, this is a very lightweight drill with a tiny battery on it. So you're much more likely to use that now than a plug-in drill. Similarly, that, these are far from my house, a Dyson. So all of the Hoovers and the like are operated with a lithium battery. This one I think is about 60 watt hours. So that is the spare battery off that device. So you're actually being encouraged, and I'm at one of those people that said, okay, I'm looking for a new drill. So there's two drills and three batteries. So it's very convenient. The technology is now there. The major change that came alongside the, um, let's say the energy density was the price. So as soon as they hit the right price, then you can actually use them in all sorts of devices. So that's, so you're familiar with seeing that as the battery pack. Uh, you're not familiar with seeing that. So that's the pouch cell. The next type of cell is prismatic cells, which are like this pouch inside a casing, which can be an aluminium casing or another metal type casing. But the workhorse battery, these are what's inside this drill. So that's the illustration that you can see there. Yeah, so that's these cylindrical cells. These are called 18650s. So 18650 is, it's 18 millimeters in diameter and it's 65 millimeters high. So it's literally the measurement of the cell. And you can see, you know, all these devices, they're just multiples of these individual 
batteries. Um, and you're looking for the amount of energy required to run the various devices. And as I say, most of these here are like 50 to 60 watt hours. So you can cut your hedge. You don't need 10 minutes to reel out the cable and 10 minutes to reel it back in again. You can just walk down and it's got a replaceable battery on it. Those of you with children have seen these devices. And obviously I'm not gonna demonstrate that one today. <laughs> But that's a much bigger battery. That's 350 yeah, uh, watt hours and above. But you've got lots of other devices as well, all the way through to your bicycles. Now you've got lots of people with e-bikes that can be up to like a kilowatt hour in energy. So um, at this point, I thought it would be useful to just look at some typical typical battery fires that have occurred and we have witnessed on YouTube and in the news. So we're starting with phone fires. So basically that phone uh, is the same as mine. It's got a device in it, a, a safety device that's built in that normally would switch it off at about 40 degrees C. So if you've left it in the car dashboard in the sun, it will heat up and then switch itself off. But if you continue to heat it, the, that battery remains the same. You're just externally heating the battery. So you get this kind of fire incident. Now that's a small battery, as I said, that's only six and a half watt hours. So that's another phone going off in the corner of this guy's workshop. And the next group are e-cigarette batteries, which are these cylindrical cells. So what, one of the things that you notice is there's virtually no warning. They're literally almost looking as though they're spontaneously igniting, whether it be the phone or the e-cigarette. Oh, hang on, we skipped a few images there. So as you can see, these are all devices that we've all got stuck in our pockets, you know, every day, and we're not actually um, seemingly concerned. And this is an interesting one, which is a power bank. So that one, this is a power bank. So you can have a look at these, obviously, when you go to lunch. So that's got four bigger cells in. So those are 21,700. So it's 21 millimeters in diameter, 70 tall. But that will charge your phone three or four times. So it, that's quite, a, as you saw, quite a, a significant fire if it's in your bag or in your pocket. This is a, a laptop, which is just sat on the desk charging. And okay, we trying to compress the videos but you can just see it literally ignites and obviously it's spraying debris all across the office across the floor so it's highly likely to actually set the office on fire I think everyone's seen this one so you got a bit of a warning Yeah, and look how much smoke, that smoke virtually instantaneously filled the room. 
This one was an, a steadier warning. Yeah, so the film guy obviously moved away as he saw it was going to uh, actually burst into flames. But you're actually looking at devices that are all in the region of 750 watt hours to a kilowatt hour now with these. That's another one, an e-scooter, I think, yeah. Just on charge in the corner of the room. And there's a couple more to just to finish off this. This is a bike, so-called, so that'll be a kilowatt hour. And that's in the lift, so the doors are shutting and that's going off. In this incident, the owner actually goes and fetches the garden hose. And he's squirting the garden hose on the battery when it moves. Yeah, so... The application of the garden hose doesn't really make any difference to that one. So we're then moving on to some bigger batteries. So these are, and the other thing I, would, I forgot to mention it in these devices is they're built in obsolescence. So the battery will go through maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand cycles of recharging and then it loses its capacity. It loses its capacity to hold charge. So you've got to replace the battery and that, that applies to all the different types of battery. So that will happen also to the car. So you will have more devices going through recycling centres. So the first video I think is a recycling centre here. So this is a selection belt. So these are the 18650s. They are they are quite explosive little batteries that will jump around. So because they've got they're in a canister, when they explode, they do go like projectiles. So this is in the recycling centre. Obviously, they saw that there was something setting on fire. They come out with a, excuse me, powder extinguishers, and they have at least two or three goes with two or three powder extinguishers. And you can see that it continues to reignite. Now, we can't see what the battery was, but I would suggest it's one that's in this small scale size wise. You can see the amount of smoke, it's almost filling the room. So you get 0.7 litres of smoke generated per watt hour. So it's massive. If you think of that, this battery, 6.5 watt hours, it's going to generate something like five litres of smoke. And obviously the flammable gases. This is now even bigger battery. So these are, this is newsreel from energy storage systems in Korea, where they've had, roughly speaking, a, a container fire per month, not last year, the year before. So this is the internal camera that's actually recording an, a, an incident. So the fire starts and it destroys the whole container. You know, what you've actually got is propagation of thermal runaway from cell to cell. So in these cells, 
it's just moving down the whole pack. So this is an illustration that the Korean authorities... There's hurt in an explosion. We are told there was some sort the of explosion. The force of the blast knocked the helmets and face masks off the firefighters. There are serious concerns being expressed tonight about lithium-ion batteries, the same batteries in practically every cell phone, laptop, and tablet on the market. So that was a bit of... Even after 24 hours of extinguishment, these ion batteries could reignite if they've been damaged. Electric vehicles have been known to reignite hours, days, or even weeks after the initial incident. Firefighters sprayed several thousand gallons of water while crashed in California in a garage. The fire brigade put the fire out after a great deal of water. It sits quiescent, apparently, and then starts belching white smoke, toxic smoke. So they put lots more water on. It's apparently quiescent again for 90 minutes, and then we get these rocket flames coming out from underneath. So they put it out again. They then lift it onto the back of the recovery truck, and that movement reignites it again. So a key question, is the vehicle out? Indeed, so a key question is, when is a battery fire out? And clearly, as you can see, um, even the fire brigade, when it's a car, are struggling with 100,000 litres. That I think in that particular incident, they mentioned 30,000 gallons in the USA were, were actually used to take control of the fire. So it, it's substantial. So what causes battery fires and what is thermal runaway? So what causes battery fires? So in all of the illustrations that you saw there, you can have any one of these different um, issues, either overcharging, overheating, penetration, crushing, short circuit. So overcharging, you've got the device, the, the phone sat in the kitchen or whatever, and it's plugged in and it's charging, and for whatever reason, it's overcharged. So the battery heats up and it goes into thermal runaway. But you can literally just put a knife through the battery. In this case, you can see this one has been folded a little bit. So you only need to flex the battery in order to break the, um, the separator, which is inside the battery, and that will create an internal short. So you can either have an external short circuit or an internal short circuit. And you get the same effect if you crush it. So in an accident, any of these vehicles that are crushed are highly likely to result in them being thermal runaway. So this is uh, a graphic of the inside of a battery. So you've got the anode and the cathode. The anode is graphite intercalated with lithium ions. The cathode can be any one of four or five different materials. So this one is lithium cobalt oxide, but you can have lithium iron phosphate, lithium nickel, manganese, cobalt. There are various different types of technology. So people refer to it as a lithium battery. Some people then will say, well, use a powder extinguisher. So these are not metallic lithium. This is a compound of lithium, so it is not metallic lithium. There are metallic lithium batteries, which are called primary lithium, but they are not usually rechargeable. So if it's rechargeable, most of the time, it's a lithium ion battery. So this is the separator. This is usually polyethylene or polypropylene, but in my phone and your phone, it's probably only 20 microns thick. Now you may recall Samsung launched a phone, which was the S7, which kept spontaneously bursting into flames. Well, they actually redesigned that phone and made the separator 12 microns thick. So it was almost half as thick. So you sat on your phone when you left in your pocket, it bends the separator and you get an internal short circuit. So anode, cathode, the other way around, separator, and in the middle, 
you've then got the liquid electrolyte. So the liquid electrolyte is usually, usually a mixture of lithium hexafluorophosphate and one of these hydrocarbons. So dimethyl carbonate, ethyl methyl carbonate. The point being that they're all hydrocarbon chains. So as soon as you heat them up, they decompose, releasing hydrogen, ethane, methane, and other flammable materials. So the reason the lithium ion battery burns readily is because part of its composition is actually flammable on decomposition. So this literally is an illustration of the short circuit. So we've broken the separator. The short circuit is inside. So you're actually heating. As soon as you've got the short circuit, it heats up. That decomposes the electrolyte. That creates an increased pressure inside that cell. Because it's a higher pressure, that's got a direct relationship to temperature. So the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up, and the temperature goes up, and it becomes a self-propagating chemical reaction. So beyond a certain temperature for each chemistry, it will then go into thermal runaway. So most of, the, most of the time you would say, well, just use a fire extinguisher. So that, like you saw in the um, recycling centre, they just went and fetched their powder fire extinguisher and applied that to the batteries and in the hope that it would work. So the next video is from, the, I think it's the Finnish military, did a, a series of tests themselves to see what was the best um, fire extinguishing agent for lithium batteries. So this electric heater underneath the batteries and they're getting the batteries going and then removing them and then applying different extinguishing agents. So you, what you're seeing is the reignition, which is typical of 18650s. So you can see, um, if I just stop that one. These are, the, the eruptions are typical of these cylindrical cells because the actual casing is um, restricting the expansion. So it, it has to go a long way and then it actually explodes. There are safety devices, so all these things you know, do have safety devices built into them. So most of the time, we are all entirely safe or as safe as you can be. Yeah, so there, there are methods that have been designed in to, to make them safe. But my point that I want everyone to understand is if you simply continue to externally heat the battery, even though you've built in the most sophisticated safety mechanism, it will still burn and the, the little cylindrical ones are frequently explosive like this. So even, it's not a fire extinguisher, it's a fireman's hose, which is five inch hose, is it? It's a, 
a lot of water is being applied and that still reignites. So the next video is a series of independent tests which were actually run in Belgium. So let's just run it. On the left side is a water-based system. So it's a water system with a surfactant additive. Yeah? And on the right is AVD. So they run in the same facility, the same cells, the same overcharging mechanism. On the left, you'll just see the water-based system. It starts to reignite now and you've got reignition, which I think was about a minute and 45 into the test. On the right side, you had AVD, which, as you can see, and I'll show you in the next video, it just coats everything. It takes longer to apply than a water extinguisher. So a water extinguisher will be emptied in about 45 seconds, a six litre, and the AVD will take nearly up to two minutes. So you're applying it and creating a coating. So these are the pouch cells I'm talking about, but bigger ones like this. So they were overcharging in the centre in exactly the same way as the previous test. So you can see it's left a coating of AVD over the top of the whole of the battery. So you, you've actually arrived at a point where the thing has exploded in the same way as the previous one. That was a system that was rigged up and it was actually uh, triggered by um, a thermal imaging camera. But it's just demonstrating that the AVD covers and then coats yeah, the, the cells. So I'll press straight on, because that's, I think, the questions that, that you're asking. So how does AVD work? So AVD is based on vermiculite. So AVD stands for aqueous vermic vermiculite dispersion. Vermiculite is a naturally occurring mineral, magnesium, aluminium, iron, silicate. And it's dug out of the ground in the form like this here, which is unexfoliated, and it's passed through a furnace at high temperature. The interlaminar water that's trapped between the flakes expands into steam and makes the product swell so that it looks something like this. If, do you want to pass these around? If you have a, a bag or two and pass them around. Um, so this is what thermally exfoliated product looks like. There we go. And that is, this has many, many different applications. There's insulation in brake pads, in animal feeds and so on. But basically, this is an inert mineral. So it's used as insulation because it has um, excellent insulating properties. So if, for example, you loft insulation, uh, sometimes uh, vermiculite was used. Now that you've got different heights required, you can't, can no longer use vermiculite, but it's got lots and lots of different applications that are every day. The AVD is 
not thermally exfoliated vermiculite mixed with water. It is chemically exfoliated vermiculite. So that's this. So this is, these are some, pass them around. These are some samples of AVD. So in the chemical exfoliation process, what you're doing is expanding, getting rid of the water that's into lamina, and then you're delaminating each small flake. So you've got millions of small flakes suspended in water. So as you can see, it's fairly fluid, but it's not as runny as water. The vermiculite content of AVD is about 17%. So you've got 17% vermiculite, 83% water. And it, it's basically like cream. Maybe not, it's a bit thicker than cream, but that's, that's basically what it looks like. So if you actually have, so we've got a, an illustration there of a battery fire. So these are these cells that I'm showing you on the desk here. These are 18650 type cells. As we've said, the battery goes into thermal runaway, so you get some smoking if you're lucky, and eventually they rupture. So this is the illustration of uh, a typical cell, which it goes off like a flamethrower, so you can get a meter long extension of flame, which hopefully you will see um, later on this morning in the, in the fire test. So, you then apply AVD. AVD is misted, but it's not like water mist. So the particles of AVD are 108, a D90, so 90% of them are less than 180 microns. 50% of them are less than about 80 or 90 microns. So well, that's the cross-sectional diameter. They are about 150 nanometers thick. So they're very fine, thin platelets. So if you want to pass these around now, listen. So these are, this is a film of AVD. We've just drawn it down on a piece of glass and you can take the film off. But it, so the platelets sit on top of each other and create an oxygen barrier. They also, as I say, it's used as a, uh, an insulator, so they create a thermal barrier. And in addition, it is non-electrically conductive. So in respect to a battery fire, you have covered all of the requirements for an extinguishing agent. So if we look at this image here, you can see that's an actual test that we have run where you've done 18650s, a pack like this. We overheat a central cell, the fire propagates through several of the cells. And when you've applied AVD, you've got this coating that sits on top of it and penetrates down between. And as the heat is taken away by the water, it, you're left behind this coating that you're looking at now. So on the right hand side, we just got a piece of polystyrene and it burns through in about 10 seconds. On the left hand side, we have coated the same polystyrene, just literally sprayed the AVD onto it and let it dry. So it's forming a film and the film is protecting the polystyrene. So in essence, you can see that the polystyrene structure remains in place even though the, some of the bubbles will collapse. So the point of that illustration is that you can, once you've coated something with AVD, you can actually externally heat it and it still doesn't <coughs> burn. So the extinguisher range that we are manufacturing with AVD, it, it gives you, it is water-based, so the characteristics of water are the cooling characteristics. So any water extinguisher will cool a lithium battery fire. 
Well, the difference with AVD is that you are creating a film that is an oxygen barrier that is covering the fuel source. So it's preventing the propagation of heat from cell to cell and it's preventing that cell from burning. It's also, as I say, you don't get, you're not going to get a short circuit because it's non-conductive. Whereas with a lot of the um, water-based systems, as the water dries out, then you get a short. And obviously, um, if you are spraying it on a large battery pack with many cells, even these incidents where I think we've talked about um, some of the, the German and Dutch uh, fire brigades immersing the complete vehicle in a, in a container of water. Yes, that works whilst it's in there, but you've, you've actually seen in America the Chevrolet Bolt, I think they took the vehicle out, left it for five days, and then it reignited as the water created a, a short. So AVD is actually impacts on every element of the fire triangle, so that's why it works differently to other agents. Okay, question. So if we can, we can now go over to the fire demo. Yeah, so um, the team from AVD will take you over to the building on the other side of the road where they should be set up for the fire. And then when we've done that, we'll come back Following on from the fires, so we're now going to talk about the product range, obviously, that you've witnessed some parts of just in the um, uh, actual fires. So we manufacture a complete range of these extinguishers that you can see. So there is an aerosol, which is 500 millilitres. Um, there is then a one litre uh, Lithex extinguisher. The one litre extinguisher is too small to meet the EN3-7 standard. So that one isn't EN3-7 certified, but then two six and nine litre units that you see here, they are all fully EN3-7 certified to class A. And the reason that they're class A is because there isn't a lithium battery fire standard, which is something we'll come on to later. Um, so as we were talking earlier about, you know, I'm looking at the battery, it's a 60 watt hour battery, it's a 10 watt hour battery, it's a 30 kilowatt hour battery. In the event of a fire and an incident, most people are just not going to know what size battery they're dealing with and they don't know whether there's one or more batteries. So what we've basically done is just given a guide here. So it's just to say, okay, it's a small, you know, the 60 watt hour, it's a phone, uh, as we were talking about, any of those types of devices, tablets, iPads, and so on. So, and these are just guidance, because as you can see, you get up to 500, 750 watt hours and which is bikes, scooters, and things like that. And that's actually quite a, a large amount of energy. So looking at the fire that we've just done, ah, so the, the, both fires with five of these batteries, there are four cells in each, and we overcharged one of them in the middle. So we basically overcharged that, and there were two either side, okay? So all the numbers are always going to be guidance. No one can say to you, uh, all right, I've got a 500 watt hour scooter. So, you know, which extinguisher is going to do it? Is it going to be six? Is it going to be nine? Is it going to be two? So it's, it's guidance. My overall advice is the bigger, the better. Yeah. So we also come around here and we have then the bigger is the trolley unit. So that's a 25 and a 50 litre trolley unit. So you've got 50 litres of AVD. So you've got 60 litres ish of product plus the unit. So, you know, they are quite bulky items. Um, but you can see around the outside then we have this range of 
um, complementary products and that's why we did the fire blanket demonstration first so this isn't the fire blanket is not a standard fire blanket such that you might have in your kitchen where you just pull down the two tabs this has been specifically designed for lithium battery fires so it is a very high temperature fabric it's a fabric that also has a, a vermiculite coating as well as other coatings on it so that it will withstand a constant temperature of a thousand degrees for a significant number of hours obviously it will in theory stand withstand it indefinitely but the so the that's this blanket that's what you were just seeing the, the test with and it's our view that most applications so where you have numbers of lithium batteries where you have uh, let's say batteries in boxes batteries on pallets and scenarios that can be difficult to deal with there's an element of uncertainty of exactly what's in there um, it's our view that you need a, a, a combined strategy you need to think about it from the perspective that yes you may have a fire extinguisher um, would it be useful to have a blanket as well in that vicinity? If it's someone that is not, you know, we, we've just had a firefighter in a complete firefighting outfit with breathing apparatus, gloves and everything, and they can get right up to the fire. Not everyone is going to want to do that. So we're just saying, you know, you need to think about the combination of these different products. So that's the, the fire blanket. So the, as I say, the, Key elements to remember are ours is not a standard fire blanket. If you look on the internet and you find a car fire blanket, normally that blanket is suitable for an internal combustion engine car fire. So it's smothering the fire and it's not for a lithium ion battery fire because the lithium ion battery fire, as you've just seen, it will burn merrily away underneath the blanket until it's completely destroyed all the cells. So if it is a car and that's a 100 kilowatt hour battery, it may sit there for four hours, six hours, eight hours, and that blanket needs to actually be able to withstand that, those conditions. Um, in addition, you can see over here these... Um, fire suppression kits. So we designed these a few years ago uh, when we were talking to airlines and the airlines had started to have fires with e-cigarettes and all the things we saw in the videos. There had been, I think the FAA had got lists of hundreds of incidents that had not um, resulted in a, a significant accident, but nevertheless, they'd had to take account of the incidents on board. And I think, we all travelled enough now to have noticed that everyone's asking you what batteries you've got in your luggage, and or they were when you were able to travel. Yeah, maybe you can start travelling again now, but that change came about because of these battery fire incidents. So we actually developed this product. Um, it's the same kind of fabric as the blanket, so it, inside it's a super high resistant fabric, a thousand degrees C constant temperature, in the larger one, it's got a flame arrester built in. So in other words, if there is a fire, uh, we can set a fire off inside the bag. The flames will not come outside the bag. You will get some venting through the flame arrester, but the idea is that you will not get external flames. And the, in our view, um, as I talked earlier about the amount of gas generated in these fires, you saw how much gas was generated from five of these batteries underneath the fire blanket. You cannot contain that. If you have a device that is sealed, it is going to create a, a massive pressure inside that vessel and it's going to heat the vessel. So. Whilst I say that you know the, there are options of really robust steel boxes, but that is not what we're doing. We're saying allow the device to vent at a controlled rate without an external flame and you have controlled 
the fire. So that's these um, kits. The kit includes uh, gloves, glasses, and can include the fire extinguisher. Oh, we've skipped on there. Anyway, so that's the same image there. So the kit can include the fire extinguisher, gloves, and as I say, in certain applications, you, and there is a video of this on our website, you can say, put the laptop out with the extinguisher, put the laptop into the bag, and then it can be safely transported or disposed of. Okay, so just going back to the um, certification, as I say, all of the extinguishers that are two, six, and nine are certified to class A. They're also uh, certified according to the Marine Directive, uh, Marine Equipment Directive. They are CE marked and will hopefully this month also be UK CA marked, and they are kite marked. But as I say, the emphasis here is that they're all in relation to Class A, because that's the only test that we could actually run uh, at the time on the extinguishers. So this brings us on to the fire standards. So the fire standards do need to, to catch up to some degree with uh, where we are with the lithium batteries. Um, in the UK, there is no fire standard, but we're not alone. There isn't an EN3 um, certification process for lithium battery fires. There are various countries, France, Holland, running and designing their own tests. So we expect there to be um, some form of European standard at some point in the future. But in my short experience in this business, it takes years to agree upon these standards. Now, maybe because of the issues that surround lithium battery fires and the number of cars and things that are gonna be with lithium batteries on the roads, maybe that process will go faster. But at the moment, there is nothing in Europe. Equally, there is nothing in the USA, and I think you were asking earlier about uh, FM and UL. Um, so we, are, we have developed the same range of extinguishers for the USA. They will be going shortly through UL certification, but again, it will be for Class A. When UL decide on a standard for lithium batteries, then we will subject the extinguishers to that test. FM tends to be systems, and again, we're working with a variety of companies looking at putting AVD into systems that are uh, suitable for lithium battery fires. So just a quick note on, on systems. Everything we've talked about so far is portable fire extinguishers. So we've been showing you that AVD works in portable fire extinguishers. The extinguishers are a higher pressure, they're 15 bar, they have our own specially designed nozzle so that you get a maximum amount of misting from the AVD given its viscosity. But what this section is about is you can design a fixed system to incorporate AVD. So, all of the uh, hardware that you would use for a water-based system is still applicable for AVD. So the pipe work, the pumping systems, or pressurization systems, it's all still the same. The, the difference is just the attaining, if you need to obtain a mist, then you need a nozzle that is specifically designed for AVD. So all of these devices, this, is basically a system that I think it was a marine or a, a motorsport system where you have a vessel uh, which is basically the same type of vessel as this but you've got a, a specialist um, uh, valve system so you can attach to it uh, a mechanism for triggering or you can uh, trigger manually. Uh, the pipe work is the same as the water everything else there is exactly the same as a water system. So what we're saying is that you can design a system, even though up to press we've been working with several companies around the world looking at systems, we are not here saying we as AVD Fire have a system. We think that companies that actually 
integrate, make systems and install systems need to work with us to design things specifically for the relevant application. Um, even though we haven't designed systems specifically for sale, we have designed systems and worked with various partners for testing. So here, uh, if you cast your mind back to the uh, early video of the energy storage systems in Korea, these, this is a test in Korea where these are, uh, I think these were Samsung uh, energy storage modules in the container. You've got racks of these modules. So we sent over AVD with the standard pipe work that we'd used in our own tests and they set up a test where they blew the AVD through the fan to flood the module. And that was the KFI, which is the Korean Fire Institute, ran these tests. They ran different products side by side to see it, what worked, what didn't work, if AVD worked. And AVD was the only extinguishing agent to put out the fire and stop it from spreading to the module above and below. And you can see one nozzle there. There were four nozzles. They were um, spraying that one into the module, but they sprayed above and below between the two other modules simultaneously to keep the to create a barrier. So Korean Fire Institute is one. We have worked in China. We have done those same when I was talking earlier about the development of standards and tests. Um, obviously the Chinese don't fit into any of our normal UL or they have their own tests so they wanted to just design a test, um, set some batteries on fire and see what could be achieved with AVD. So they made their own cabinets, they sprayed um, pouch cells in cabinets, they sprayed um, the, the 18650 cells and so they ran their own series of tests. So. You know, they, they, it, this is not just the UK, it's not just Europe. Almost all around the world we have been running these kind of tests. Uh, in RISE in Sweden, the tests are currently underway, I think, so I can't give you a result on that, but they are looking... Uh, RISE is the Research Institute of Sweden. They are looking at, at testing because of the car ferries. So they're... Already, I think Sweden is definitely ahead of us in terms of the number of electric vehicles. So the car ferries are already transporting more electric vehicles than probably in Europe. And they, they are going to be carrying more. So RISE are running these tests to determine what systems, if any, are appropriate to, uh, to roll on, roll off car ferries. Uh, JLR, Tesla, Volvo are just you know, those household names that, you know, they have said, well, can we run tests with your product? Can we, uh, and obviously some of them are customers, I'm not going to say who's a customer who's not, but, you know, we are already selling to these people and we are already supplying units for testing up to trolley units. And then the, the bottom one, Cold Cut Systems, is a Swedish company that manufactures a system which is a high-pressure system for blasting a hole in the side of the car directly into the battery so you can flood the battery. So again, they are running independent tests to look at can this system be adapted for uh, use with AVD. We're also, you know, that it's a small cross-section of, of some of the tests that we're running. There are lots of people now looking at what is the best solution um, for their particular scenarios. Okay, so again, most of the things that we talked about, we've talked about up to like a 50 litre um, trolley unit. We are also looking at systems to provide more AVD. If, if um, you know, it's a warehouse or something where you know there are pallets and pallets of lithium ion batteries, then one of the things that you can do with AVD is use it as a fire break. Instead of putting out the fire that you've got 
spray everything that's next to it and prevent the fire spreading to it. So you may need physically more volume. So we are working on systems that this one, instead of having a, a pressure vessel full of AVD, this system would work. It's still, you still have a nitrogen source, but it, it's to aspirate the AVD from the tank and allow you to spray without having it from a, a pressure vessel. So there's a, there's a lot of work currently underway and those people that, that are in the room here today that are actually thinking of doing testing, you know, we want to do more testing. We want to be involved in testing so that we all get more and better information. So the last subject, and not the, it's not the least subject, is the toxic potential of battery fire. So I'm sure that most of the, the people in the room have um, at least heard some of the discussions which have surrounded battery fires in terms of you know, what the emissions are. So typically, um, if, so if you saw the, when we got the fire blanket, we got the smoke and fumes coming out from underneath the fire blanket and you can, there is a certain odour to the electrolyte. So you've got absolutely definitely uh, a range of these gases. These are not our numbers, these are taken from like RISE and various other American institutes. So they will tell you that's a lithium cobalt cathode, you get 30% uh, carbon monoxide, 30% carbon dioxide, 25% hydrogen, 15% uh, the other hydrocarbons that we talked about earlier. And that's the NMC version, so the, it's the same gases, just in different percentages. Um, and this whole subject has some very um, different authors have different views. And it's not our position here today to say, we think this is right or we think this is wrong. We're just saying, you know, I have on the table here a number of papers from different institutes and they, they say different things. So they say what the results of their tests were. And in my view, this is an area where a lot more work needs to be done. So we need to understand better what gases are given off and in particular uh, HF. So it is clear that in all fires, there are toxic fumes. In all fires and in all, if you're in a confined space, you know, these gases will kill you anyway. The issue with HF is that we need to know more about how much is generated, under what conditions it is generated and that data can only be obtained, if you like, under much more controlled conditions than the ones that you've witnessed today. So we are looking for companies to work with to find out more information about HF, about what is generated under what circumstances, from what chemistry, so that we're all better informed. But yes, there are several uh, toxic chemicals that are generated in, in these fires. Now, as I said, we have been working with other uh, agencies and facilities around the world. Uh, this is an extract from the Journal of Electrochemical Conversion and Energy, and it's a piece of work done totally independently by a group of Chinese engineers. And so I'll just read what they concluded. I put the blue text in. The AVD fire extinguishing agent absorbed a large amount of the toxic elements within the smoke during the three-state conversion of gas liquid solid. Thus, the AVD demonstrates clear advantages in reducing harmful smoke components of battery fires. Now that, that is this group of Chinese guys. This, when, when we give you these presentations, you can look that up. That is the act, extract and you, you have to pay yet yeah, to download this document, but it does suggest that AVD also uh, has an impact on the amount of toxic fumes liberated. Now, I, as I say, I don't have 
any solid numbers on that and we want to do more work, but we think that is equally important work that needs to be done going forward. Um, so I mentioned earlier we, you know, we are working with different companies around the world and people are catching up in, uh, you know, outside the Eurozone as it were. Um, so we now have, I think it's 22 or something like that, uh, distributors around the world. We are manufacturing these extinguishers in the US, or we will be. The first um, shipments will be in October, so they are manufactured in the USA. We send the AVD to the USA, they're manufactured there. We're manufacturing in India, manufacturing in China, and potentially filling and the like in Singapore and in different places around the world. So this is not just the UK. Okay, so I think we've got...